Hello and welcome back um, to Cutting with uh, with Brian and I, Bucklew. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get it. Get you got it? it. Yeah, I, I got it. <laughs> uh, it's not a, not something that someone should be proud of, probably, but I got it. So there we go. I'll be proud of it. I'm going to take the W on that one. Um, so I'm, I am currently lost, but I just asked about where I am, so I'm no longer lost. And I'm just trying to claw my way up to not level two jump into the rust wells yeah i was honestly if i hadn't got stun locked in red rock i i would have felt pretty good about the progress made there um all right so we touched on uh gamma well we didn't really touch on i i wanted to avoid gamma world because i know that it has played such a um I, I, like such a strong influence but i know that you've you've kind of like deviated from the from the source books like you you're doing your own thing and i think it's uh yeah it's it's not it's not too strongly a, a gamma world rogue like um game world is definitely an influence but it's it's one of a big constellation of influences i um i was like pretty super like i never played gamma world it was something it's, it's always going to be this the thing i i would like to play one day but we'll never find players for because it is it is quite robust as a ttrpg and uh uh, it's hard enough to find players for anything, really. Um, but uh, I did flip through it because I, I did, you know, understand or know some of the influence there. And was surprised to see quite a lot of, like, you know, bits and pieces here that I had discovered in, uh, you know, like things like vibroblades and, um, you know, even some of the terminology felt like... Not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't say, like, pulled, but, like, it, it, it felt very familiar. Um... So I, yeah, I, I part of that part of that is 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 from shared influences, right? Like we definitely we definitely pulled from Gamma World, but Gamma World also pulled from a set of influences um that that we pull from that are just interesting. Um like the idea of a uh like a temporal fugue is is actually from a earlier 70s uh sci-fi novel. Um from, written by I forget who wrote it. It was like it's like it was like some kind of some. It was like a bunch of Amazons. It was written by like Jim Bader Fannin or something. I don't I don't remember exactly. That's not the um, uh, the man who folded himself, is it? It's probably it's more recent. More, yeah, um, but like Game World's also like a pretty Gonzo world. It's it's a it's a very Fallout esque romp through ruins um which i like i frankly think is the weakest aspect of gamma world uh is the setting the strongest aspect for me was always the really compelling character creation um where you would just create these whacked out mutants that were pretty interesting to imagine um and that that i think is the strongest element of inspiration that caves of cud um pulled in because the the range of interesting characters you can get out of Gamma World's character creation or Rift's character creation, which we both did a lot of in our teens, um, really inspired us to want to make a game where you can come out of character creation with a character that's more interesting than just, uh, you know, a, a race and class pair duo from Dungeons & Dragons right um yeah and i mean like it's fair to say that um caves of code oh this is gonna this is not gonna end well hold on a second um caves of code has probably one of the most robust like character creators that i, I mean that i'm aware of i, I like and, Too robust probably right like <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it's it's something that i definitely like i've i've um talked about this in you know my various series but like i i actually can't really play too many rpgs these days because it, it just all feels like a wet match compared comparatively speaking and i'm not like i'm just i'm not trying to just like say i you know cud beats them all but um it it feels like I, i've been spoiled you know like nothing really um, gives me that same sense of like I uh, of exploration, not even just in the world, but in like 
what kind of what kind of character haven't I tried yet? Um, we we made this game mainly because we wanted to we wanted to, to to play this game, right? We were like, what what if we had a game that really leaned into inspirations like Star Control and Game World and Rifts and you know these weird sci-fi games we want to we wanted to play it and it didn't exist and so we 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 had to make a game that we could play a little bit um which meant having like a big surprising array of outcomes and game world or you know game world was so fun to play for instance like jason's got a bunch of stories he tells about like making a two-headed time tortoise right like that was something that you you could not do in any game. There were a few game world inspired likes before games of kind of like Alpha Man, um, but they they again tended to lean into sort of like this Fallout esque world that just was not compelling to walk around. Right, like I don't really want to just to walk around in the shattered ruins of a civilization as a as a turtle, and that was true even in Game World. Right, like what what really what really compelled us is making these weird characters in these systems, you know, like making a skeleton guy in Rifts, making a time tortoise in, in Gamble World, you know, ma making making Dark Sun or Spelljammer characters, and then interrogating what it's like to actually inhabit those kinds of weird things. And what would happen if you actually had a society of these weird things? Like, what happens when you got a society of time tortoises? What is it, we, you know, like, what is that like? That's those are the kind of questions that end up being interesting interesting to us that even the existing RPGs did never tried to engage with not real not deeply, um, and so we tried to engage with that in Caves of God and you know like you can judge how well or poorly we succeeded at it um, certainly and completely, <laughs> but it allowed us to explore the things that we found really interesting about those kinds of games. So this kind of um, semi answers a question I was uh, I was gonna, you know, I, I this is really the big question for me, and I I really want to like I want to avoid certain spicy topics because I know that like Caves of Cud has been a very eventful party to to put it lightly in the last sure. couple of years, um, and mostly because I don't want to like give anyone a sense of like satisfaction for even talking about those things but the re really the big question for me that um i would confirm my bias somewhat is would you say that caves of cud is really about being weird i would like to some extent i think caves of cud is a lot about um atomization of identity right like what what happens when you take pieces of what we think it means to be human and pop them out and recombine them in interesting ways, both physically and culturally. Um, and that recombination, sure, you want to call it weird, that's fine. But it's also about, you know, what's not, you know, what's not weird when you pop it out? What actually is a through line that you might find in a society of like laser ducks that you might also find in, in, in human society. Right. Right. It's, it's, it's like just about interrogating, interrogating like your own relationship to those, to those pieces of identity. That's, um, that's an interesting way of put it. I guess, um, like the way I'm phrasing it, it could almost like seem or sound offensive in a way, but I guess what I really mean is like, to me, um, what, you know, uh, what inhabits a lot of CUD is like um, a sense of variety. Like you've got this mm -hmm. massive character creator, you've got this massive collection of body parts that you have, um, you know, given agency to, like everyone could be anything, literally. Uh, and you also have inhabiting this world uh, a, a force of like no everyone must be x must be this one thing yep. um so i i feel like it it just seems um like these are two very counter uh 
they're opposing forces the idea of being different and being the same um and i feel like the bias of cud generally speaking is it is good to be different yeah i think well i think you know like from my perspective cud makes the point that the people demanding a return to this old individual way are just kind of ignoring the fact that you've got this blossoming diverse ecosystem of cultures and physiological forms that is doing just fine. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, um, and so it interrogates these real world forces of, of like literal, literal biologic diversity and cultural diversity and, and forces saying, Hey, you know, like this is, this is, this is too much, right? Like you, you've, you've, <laughs> done away with something important to us um we perceive we perceive that this is impinging upon um an an, an order which which we value um that's not only like the templar though right like like plants and fungus hate each other right like there's plenty of animosity between these new diverse you know, d diverse coalitions of, of creatures and beings. So it's it's not any kind of utopian world, right? Like it's a really within... like I hadn't even honestly. And this is this is so, such a dumb thing, right? Is like you get these these arguments that become so loud that they kind of drown out a lot of like matter of fact things. Is like there's um, there's so many different forces in code that it's mm -hmm. like it doesn't there's, matter. There's plenty of conflict, and and <laughs> even when you take out when you take out the sort of the the Templar genetic genetic um, concerns, right? Like cultural monolith concerns. There's there's not everyone's friendly here, right? Like there there's there's a lot of there's a lot of conflict between these new ways of new life ways new cultural ways it's fair to say that cut is not a very friendly place it's i mean it can be friendly there's plenty that's there's plenty of welcoming communities right like cut it cut is cut, like that diversity means it can be dangerous though right like right. you get it you get out there and you uh, could run into a you know like a dragon village that likes to roast humans right like it's 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 it can be a pointy place for sure I'm gonna I'm gonna throw um I actually I have a question regarding Argov, but I'm not sure if now is the best time. I Yeah, why not? I don't know. Like I, I almost like wanted to avoid even talking about the Templar because I think that conversation is honestly really exhausting. Um just in general. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, like I like I said, I don't wanna like give anyone the satisfaction of even like uh giving it energy, I suppose. Um but uh, on so let, let me let me let me completely pivot here and talk about or ask about Argive. This is a very specific question, and um, again, like I have my own biases, and I really just want to know um, something really specific. It's a really dumb thing. Um, you, uh, or not you, but uh, the the Rust Wells got updated, and they have like they now have a sense of verticality. Um, and something I only kind of recently glommed onto or, or kind of discovered was like you can um, with consistency find Argive's pupil yeah. out in the wilds. That's right. And he is, uh, he is the flattened remains. Um, and this corpse consistently spawns with mechanical wings. Yeah. So uh, I guess my wonder is, was this was this a grand plan in the sense that you always intended to have a an unspoken story here for Argive's pupil, or was there always a plan there? I I think I have to say that that is redacted. We do, we tend to not address the our internal lore understanding. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. That's because because it's it's I, th I think it's probably the most fun thing to do in cud outside of just like hoofing it around is to unfold the the lore and take your take on it because i think like everybody even inside the team has 
different takes on it. And like, I know I have a, a sort of incomplete look on this layered world. Um, and it's, it's, it's a game that really rewards the read. Um, like, not all sets of lore are rewarding to, to read and unpack. Um, Caves of Cud is one of them, where there's been a lot of prefiguring and thought about meaning and, and the basis of the lore that you're reading and what's really going on subtextually to the text. Um, and I think it would be kind of spoiling it to give my read on the subtext, especially since my read on the subtext isn't canon any more than yours is, really. That's That actually conveniently brings me to a potentially equally, like, spicy... Like, I'm not going to call it spicy. I appreciate that. Um, I, I think that, uh, like, in a way, like, um, you wouldn't want your take to be considered canon right um and i guess that's like something else i've always wondered and i asked i asked kaylin about this um and she had a really like she had said previously that she didn't necessarily consider anything to be canon that there was in fact no canon to cud and i found that that to be a really interesting idea but then when I asked about it in my other series w with her, um, she said, well, that's that isn't actually that can't objectively be true in a sense that it was something that there she, is. She I mean, we have an we have an internal canon. We we know what we as the development team think is objective baseline reality for Cud. Like we have a bunch of wiki pages where we spell out that baseline canon but everything that you see in game is seen through some kind of lens right you're 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 seeing the baseline truth of of cud reflected through some kind of individual view that's informed by the view's history, by its understanding of culture. And this is this is a big textual part of the game, um, especially when you look at the hi history of the Sultans, for example. Um, we, we do a lot of in-game textual work showing that these objective events in-game are in fact only ever surfaced in a subjective way. And that's true, not only in Cud, but in the world that we all live in. Okay. So, um, do you consider, or is is the main character, I say the main character, is the character that the player is playing, um, are they considered a character? I know that's a weird question, but it's, like, there there's so many layers of, like, um, uh, obfuscation you know, between you and the, think, and the game. I mean, I think I think textually, yes, especially when you get into the end of the Tomb of the Eaters, your character's clearly situated in the in the um, sort of concrete reality of the history of the game. <laughs> Literally, um, uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, that's okay. That's a it's an because here's like that that's something that. Um, like I, I've played so much of um, Cud before getting to the Tomb of the Eaters. I'm actually pretty only very recently, I guess last year, was able to even consistently get to the Tomb of the Eaters, yeah. uh, and it almost feels like it um, breaches a line because up until that point, I mean, I know you talk to the Barathermites and you play a role in the world and you you obviously change it in a meaningful way, but that, that, that all of that never really feels like to me, like um, you or the player or the main character, it feels like the world has changed and you observed it. And yep. none of that had much to do with you. Like maybe you played a role, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the world is changing and, and you are there to observe it. I mean, I think a different way to ask this question is that, like, 
are you a, a particular chosen one in CUD? And the answer is not really. Um, you're you're working in a big constellation of of historic events. You are an actor in that in that constellation, um, and you know by 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 way of the if you follow the main plot at least you end up being pretty deeply entangled in important events, but not not sort of because of specifically what or who you are, but rather because you your agency sort of involves you in this in in this tangle you're very much like thrust into some kind of like i, I wouldn't call it destiny but like something yeah yeah and i mean it's it's not necessarily destiny right like you can just not engage with that it's you, you gotta it's 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 ultimately your decision to to sort of go into that tangle or not and you know you can go wander around cud and do other stuff if you want. Just never talk to Argive. Just never talk to Argive. Um, I, okay, this is a very specific. Um, and again, you're you're welcome to to not answer this. Um, but I've always wondered. Narf clued me into the fact that after you take the um, the quest from the Zealot in the in the main in, in Jopa, you can just you can just kill him. Yep. Um, is that? And sometimes in- they'll get murdered. Anyway, our guy will sometimes just jump out of his hut and beat him to death with <laughs> a book or something, right? Is uh, is that in like intended? Well, I mean, Cud doesn't have any characters you can't sort of do whatever you want to. Um, one of the one of the one of the things that Cud is most precious about, um is having each creature and object in the game be as simulated as the player. There's no real difference between you and a wall in CUD, really, even technically. Um, You can animate any wall in CUD and take over its body. And so, in the same way that you're a fragile being, so is everything else in CUD. And so we don't even have as much protection as Morrowind, where we know if you've broken the main quest line, you can just break it. Um, and so you, in fact, have quite a lot of agency in the game. And so the alternative, I mean, really, what's the alternative to allowing you to beat the, the Zealot to death? Um, well, the alter- alternative would be that Jopa cares about him at all. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of irritating, <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> It's it's clear that the people of Jopa have a sort of an ambivalent attitude toward him. Um, we could make him friendly to Jopa, but we haven't. So you can read what what you want into that. I guess I've I've always been fat, like interested in that. Like I, I, I if it was ever possible, I would want like I, I know a, you probably won't, and that's fine. Um, but I've always wondered, like, is, is there more going on there? Like, are they a recent addition to Jopa? Like, did they just wander into Jopa and start, like, you know, preaching uh, the Mechanicus, you know, book? Um, and, like, they're just fed up with him. Has he been there for years and they are sick to death of him? Um, like, yeah, we, we just don't know for sure. We you're just you're don't coming know. in from a. Coming in from an outside perspective, you're an outsider to Jopa when you arrive, and so kind of dropped into a situation you gotta you gotta infer. Well, seeing as I I I, I the player um, receive an objective benefit for killing the zealot, I will probably always do so. Um, but I I do think it's it's pretty funny. <laughs> um, okay, so that none of that was actually on my list here. So let's let, let me get, jump on my list here oh um just like the last here touching up on um influence uh what is your what is a favorite tribute or reference to influential material that you or someone else has like contributed to cud um there are a very few references one one very obvious one that's pretty good is that there is a there's a pretty pretty strong reference to um apocalypse now heart of darkness in in the mammoth quest right like that's a that's a very deliberate 
pretty elaborate reference. Um, can you actually go into detail on that? Because I'm not I, I like it. I, I, I missed it completely. Um, well, I don't want to spoil it all, but okay. <laughs> have, all right. have, you, have you seen have you you've seen like Apocalypse Now? I'll be honest. I have not. Oh, uh, you should. It's quite good. <laughs> OK, um, all right. Uh, Tell it's you what, not... I'll, I'll, I'll watch it before next uh, next week, and then we can um, we can jump back on that. Okay. Yeah, the the it's it's based on a novel called Heart of Darkness, which is also quite good. All um, right. And there are, there are a bunch of explicit references in one of the one of the mainline quests. Hold up. Ah, oh, there is a campfire. Okay, cool. Wait, where is it? No, oh, there it was on the blood. All right. Okay. Well, then uh, let me move on from that. Um, uh, so, okay. What is a piece of fiction you recommend to anyone? And it can be obvious. I put in brackets here, like for instance, like if you just straight up recommend everyone read Lord of the Rings, then any recommend to anyone. Wow, that's who 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 would read it? What would I recommend to anyone? Um, I think everybody should play Star Control too. Does that count as a piece of media? I, should it be something to read? I'll, I'll I'll accept that. I actually, because of you, did try Star Control too. <laughs> it's so good. It's, it it definitely caught me off guard. I was not expecting basically the whole game. Yeah, any you not expecting any anything about it. Anything about it. Not expecting like animated aliens or like voice acting or. Um, like the the systems regarding your spaceship the customization like any of it it's the whole thing it was is... a real revelation in the mid 90s when it came out i mean it's still it still feels ahead of its time in a lot of ways um, um, there is a way to you can play there's a there's a thing called Urquan masters which is a modern remaster of it um that's which, the one i played open source yeah yeah it's it's probably the right way to play it these days I'll put the uh, link in the description so people can can check that out. But it is just a brilliant piece of of sci-fi writing and humor. It's like it's like deeply funny um, in a way that video games often aren't can't be. Um, and just like elaborate world building, you can roam across the whole galaxy. Um, and there's a bunch of interesting aliens and a bunch of interesting characters. It's just it's just pretty wonderful. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to jump back into it. I've been there's a like two or three space sandbox or space sims. I've been like, you know, this when I've when I've got the itch, I'm gonna probably jump on that. I don't. I don't know if you try. Have you tried Star Sector? No, I've not played Star Sector yet. Do you know of it? I do. That's uh. Um, that was likely gonna be my next space sim, but I might come and jump back on Urquan. Yeah, like Jason and I are both big fans of the older. Elder Scrolls games, especially Morrowind. Um, Morrowind is obviously, I mean, extremely popular, but it's 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 still one of the greats. Um, I think like Left Hand of Darkness is such a good book um, if you're looking for interesting sci-fi world building. Um, oh, Gene Wolfe stuff, Book of the, I actually would recommend like Book of the Long Sun over Book of the New Sun. Book of the New Sun is also amazing, but if you just want to pick one Book of the Long Sun, I feel like is a little more accessible. Um, they're part of a, a trilogy of, of books. Um, Book of the Long Sun is kind of in the middle, but they're only loosely related. I didn't um, know that. I, I only um, read Shadow of the Torture, so I, I I have actually not much knowledge on on the follow-ups or successors. Yeah, Book of the Long Sun is wonderful. I would highly recommend it. I found it much more accessible than Book of the New Sun, even though Book of the New Sun was was amazingly good. Um, I've just realized... Mechanical for Leibowitz is great. Dune is great. Um, I guess... Um... A good follow-up, and uh, this will be the last of the recommendations, maybe, but um, it, for those who are, you know, in, influenced, obsessed, you know, by specifically Caves of Cud, like, what, to, to, like, further their pursuit of, like, I want more of this, what would be a good recommend? 
I mean, Heart of Darkness seems like a good. Yeah, good Heart of Darkness. Place. Is interesting. It's it's less more of that. Um, um, I think like modern game systems, um, like Eclipse Phase, is really great. It's a it's a really interesting. It's different than than Caves of Cud, but it has a similar um, uh, sort of introspective look on what it means to be human by uh, disassociating it into parts. Um, <laughs> Just a game uh, where you spend the whole time disassociating. Yeah, it's well, Eclipse Phase is is a really cool hard sci-fi setting. Um, sort of like it's sort of like the Expanse, but with with body swapping and animals and animal bodies and stuff. Um, so if you like the Expanse, Leviathan Wakes, and you like Caves of Cud, I would recommend checking out Eclipse Phase. Gamma World's great. Rifts is something else. If you never played Rifts, it's it's an interesting it's I, an interesting game system um i don't know that one like it, yeah is yeah it an RPG? yeah yeah it's a it's a rpg by palladium books definitely recommend it um it's it's something else uh let's see what else what what else could i recommend like the old sword and sorcery stuff robert e howard writing conan and clark ashton smith are, is is pretty amazing um that's it's like got a little bit of the tonality that that influenced cut um war fortress is amazing <laughs> you like the simulative systems that's you know if you know about caves of cutty prior you know about war fortress but if not um it's great uh other roguelikes that 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 really strongly influenced cud were like adam um, for a lot of the systemic complexity and the way you've got sort of static lore. Also, Omega was a big influence on me. Um, it was one of the very early open world roguelikes um, where you sort of started in a town and you had a, a world to explore. Um, both fantasy, but... Omega? Still can help. Yeah, Omega. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of the least known of the big open world roguelikes, I think. But I got my hands on it early and it really really opened by just for my own sake because i'm probably going to follow up on on this by checking it out but um like what what uh, like age or era is that would you say that's from um it's one of the older roguelikes i want to say it was released in the very late 80s um but it might let's see here yeah it was it's in the very late 1980s so it, it is from Let's see here. Omega was released by Lawrence Brothers in 1988. Um, so it's like going on 40 years old. Wow. Um, and it was it was it 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 was a real treasure trove of of forward looking ideas. It was really ahead of its time. Um, it had multiple endings. It had, you started in the city, the city had like these guilds and it had a little maze and it had a bank and it had colleges. Um, it really prefigured, um, a lot of the stuff Elder, Elder Scrolls did. And I think all prefigured games that are still yet to be made, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of room for games like Elder Scrolls that are replayable in ways that caves, like Caves of Cud, um, and those games like... Still, Omega will be prefiguring them when they're made in 10 years. When people start, you know, really mating procedural systems and big handwritten worlds, which I, I think they ultimately will. <laughs> um, why don't we put a break there? That seems like a good way, good place to, to end, maybe. And then sure. uh, we'll 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 pick it up in the next episode. Sounds good. Um, and I'll have I have a good I have a good question for to start the next episode. Should be good. All right. Um, if you are enjoying the series, definitely hit the like button and consider subscribing for more of this. I'll see you guys next time.